Uh, we had a couple of talks on race. We learned about the Navy and naval exploration. That was fantastic. We had literature most recently. And then, crazy enough, we had our first Kinder Institute seminar on John Locke. I mean, how we would lasted five years before we did that. So it was a fantastic uh, seminar. And we're going to end with a bang tonight um, with our distinguished visiting lecture, our annual distinguished visiting lecture. I'm going to introduce her in just a second. But first, I want to give a couple of thank yous. Um, first, I want to thank all of the faculty members that have served as faculty hosts for the various speakers uh, this semester. Um, it's a fun thing to do, but it also takes uh, some time and some work. So shout out. And of course, our political scientists, unless they're playing hooky, like a few who won't be named, uh, aren't going to be here tonight because of the weird practice of having departmental meetings on Fridays at 3.30. What kind of department is that? So they won't be here, but we can uh, give a silent shout out to Rudy, who hosted James Patterson, uh, Jeff Pasley, who hosted Michael Fernie. Charles Zug, who won't be here, who hosted Claire Arsenis, that was our lock talk. Uh, Marcus, uh, who hosted uh, Maria Hammock. Uh, and then Matt, most recently, who hosted Laurie uh, Balfour. So thanks to all of them. Let's give them a round of applause. Uh, and then the biggest thanks of all um, goes to Jordan, uh, Jordan Pellerito who does so much to make this fortnightly colloquia series possible. Um, I can assure you it seems like this is just a natural, organic thing that happens, but it's not. It takes an enormous amount of work, and Jordan does so much. Uh, without Jordan, I don't imagine we would have anything like a successful running series. She handles the logistics, the communications with the speakers, the wonderful flyers, including this week's flyer, which I think is fantastic, uh, on Jefferson, and also arranges the graduate uh, student meetings, which often come before the events themselves on the Friday. Let's give Jordan a big round of applause. <laughs> now, to our speaker today, it's a pleasure to welcome, to welcome back to the Kinder Institute, the University of Missouri, to welcome Krista Dirksida, the Brockman Foundation, Jefferson Scholars Foundation professor. And as the old saying goes, if you have foundation in your job title, you're important. If you have it twice, you're very, very important. Um, and she is. She, she is important. Um, I mean, she is an authority on Jeffersonian America wide-ranging interests, I love that, not just kind of one thing that she does, but looks at the period in the whole. She's written about race, she's written about politics, she's written uh, more recently about empire, and she's interested in both uh, academic audiences, which I refer to as nerd fests, um, and also reaching public audiences and all the work that she has done over the years at Monticello. Uh, her first book, Amelioration and Empire, Progress and Slavery in the Plantation Americas, both advanced, I think, some of the historiographic momentum at the time and reconsidering slavery, but also went against the grain in showing how anti-slavery and pro-slavery thought had some very important common denominators. Uh, and her next book, which she'll talk about today, the title being, <laughs> it's different from the... It's okay. It's different from the flyer, but her title today, Equal and Independent, I guess we'll hear her and what she has to say rather than me. But last not least, let me just say this about Krista. There's so many like big professors that come here and give talks, um, but what sets her apart is uh, the kind of person that she is. And I think I speak on behalf of everyone here at the Institute um, to thank her for all that she's done for the Kinder Institute, for being a mentor to so many of our students, undergraduate and graduates, uh, for being a committed educator, both when she was here as a faculty member and now as a visiting professor, and a very generous colleague. And I've greatly benefited uh, from her time and from her wisdom already this semester. Without further ado, let's give it up to Krista Dirksider. <laughs> Okay, well thank you uh, Jay for that very generous uh, introduction. 
Um, Jay, I was actually thinking about when we first talked about this project. I think it was in 2015, and I think we were taking a walk around Maudlin College at Oxford. I'm pretty sure I, was, I had that sort of memory today. But in any event, I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you all for coming um, on this sort of cold and nasty winter day. I appreciate you coming out. And it's wonderful to have so many colleagues, friends, and students here um, today. So I really appreciate it. So as Jay said, uh, the talk that you're going to hear today is drawn from my forthcoming book. Um, this is a book that is about Thomas Jefferson's family members on both sides of the color line. It is a global history of that family. And it's really about um, their lives and experiences and the making of 19th century America. So it's supposed to be coming out in the fall, but who knows what Yale is doing these days. Um, so I wanted to begin with this uh, image very deliberately. Um, this is an image of Monticello I'm pretty sure very few of you have seen before, if at all. Um, this, is, this is an image of Monticello in the late 19th century um, as it had been sort of plunged into decay um, when no one cared about it and nobody cared about Jefferson. I think one of the things that we forget often is that between the Civil War and FDR, Jefferson really sank into obscurity. Uh, people didn't really care about him. They didn't really talk about him. And this really resonates um, with his family as well. People think, oh, they're going to reference Jefferson, or oh, they're going to reference Monticello. But no, more often than, than not, what they reference are these principles. And I'm going to talk about that more today. OK. So until quite recently, I think people, if you said, if I said Thomas Jefferson's family, um, they would have thought something like this. This is an 1825 depiction of Monticello. It is a sort of um, image of, of uh, uh, domesticity, of whiteness, right? The family members that you do see are his two white granddaughters and his grandson, George Wythe. OK? Um, and these would be people who would fall under that definition of family. This is um, Anne Carey Bankhead, excuse me, Anne Carey Randolph Bankhead, the eldest uh, grandchild. This is her sister, Septimia Randolph. Um, and this is their youngest brother, whom you just saw on that lawn. This is George, George Wythe Randolph, who was the Secretary of War for the Confederacy during the Civil War. OK, so if I said Jefferson's family, that's immediately who people would think of. But part of this project is trying to think about family and push um, and broaden that category and complicate it, right? And get us to think about um, family that included someone like this, OK? This is also a grandchild of Thomas Jefferson, but also of Sally Hemings. Her name is Ellen Wales uh, Hemings Roberts. Um, this is her sister, uh, Harriet Butler Spears. Um, and this is, right here on the bottom sort of right, Beverly Jefferson, their cousin, as well as his sons. Okay, so part of the thrust of the book is to try to get us to think about family in this much more capacious, complicated, and inclusive manner that I don't think we're used to th um, thinking about as much. However, this is not just a biography, OK? It's really important to me to restore uh, and acknowledge the integrity of their lives. But I think we can see so much more when we think about their experiences in their lives. And that is, they offer a kind of lens to the rise of 19th century America, and not just a nation, but also, as Jay said before, an empire. OK, so the departure point of this book is not the more familiar Declaration of Independence. This is, of course, the Dunlop copy that Congress ratified uh, that you all know. Uh, and I'm sure, if I sort of um, queried the room, that the second paragraph would be extremely familiar to all of you, right? It contains those iconic words, all men are created equal. However, it's this version that really frames my book 
This is the rough draft of the declaration that Jefferson scratched out in a Philadelphia boarding house in the hot summer of 1776, okay? And part of what I'm trying to do in this framework is to emphasize that this is very much a wartime document, okay? This emerges out of wartime necessity, okay? Um, it has to do a lot of work in the context of 1776. It has to mobilize people, um, military resources. It has to move the needle on public opinion in what is, uh, in many ways, a very unpopular war against one of the world's greatest empires, okay? So this is a historical document. It's not a, a timeless document as we now think of it, okay? It is firmly anchored in 1776. But I'm most interested in these two paragraphs, okay? And I want you all to remember that Jefferson initially wrote this document to be heard, not to be read, okay? So the way it sounds and the repetition of certain phrases are very, very important in this document, okay? And I'm not here to tell you that the first paragraph is more important than the second or that the second is more important than the first. I'm here to tell you that they are inextricably linked. They complement each other, okay? The first paragraph inaugurates a new nation in the world, no longer a collection of 13 backwater colonies. We have an independent state that is supposedly on par with European states. Kind of a cra crazy assertion, but that's, <laughs> that's what he's just declaring. Um, and the second paragraph is a modifier. It's that nation that gives these rights to all men um, described in that second paragraph, okay? So you can't have one without the other. But, that, but as I'm sure you'll notice, there is a phrase that's repeated, okay? And that is equal and independent. This is edited out of Congress's version, okay? But Jefferson is nothing if not deliberate. And it is these two principles, entangled concepts, that undergird the American Revolution and serve as the basis for human freedom, okay? That is what he is telling us in these documents. And I think these are the concepts that are picked up, redefined, reinterpreted by his descendants on both sides of the color line in the 19th century. Okay. So some of you might think that the Treaty of Paris of 1783 sealed the deal on independence. Legally speaking, at least, right? The United States is independent from the British Empire. But one of the premises of my book is to suggest that independence was actually a messy, protracted, contested process that lasted well into the 19th century, if not into the 20th, okay? And that these family members are thrust into the middle of that process, okay? Um, so I think what happens here for the Hemingses and the Randolphs, right, is that they're forced with trying to make sense of revolutionary era principles in a historical context that is at least half a century removed from the American Revolution, okay? Um, and this I think Jefferson sets up Right? Because even though he thinks these are enduring principles, he acknowledges that they have to be interpreted and implemented differently according to different historical contexts. That's the only way you get progress, folks. Otherwise, you may as well be a monarchy. And he makes this distinction. He says, if you don't change, right? if you don't think about the application of these principles differently, you're no better than a king. Okay, so that's his distinction. And all of these family members essentially answer, I think, in similar ways. They suggest that their own experience, their own historic circumstance, helps them better secure and realize these principles, rather than um, leaning heavily on or just repeating the wisdom of the past. Folks like Jefferson or Washington or even Benjamin Banneker or Lemuel Haynes, right? They do not want to repeat um, what has been said 
before, because this is a new day, a new dawn, the 19th century. Okay, so broadly speaking, this project is divided into three parts. Um, the first part, actually I'm not sure if it's the first part in the book, but the first part um, essentially sort of embeds the white Randolphs in slavery's capitalism in the early 19th century. And it suggests that these men who are rendered penniless, impoverished because they inherit Jefferson's de um, debts, look to slavery and the various technologies emerging and undergirding that expanding system in order to claim a place that they deem that is both independent and, and equal to other white elites. Um, I also look at the putatively free North. What happens when free African American members of this family, the Hemingses, leave the slave state of Virginia, right? They've been freed by Jefferson um, and have to go to places like Ohio and Wisconsin, okay? This is an era, don't forget, in which the federal government does not mete out any kind of national citizenship, okay? There's nothing about that in the Constitution. Instead, it is states who award citizenship. So when the members of the Hemingses go to a place like Ohio, they aren't considered citizens, okay? In fact, um, they have to go through incredible obstacles in order to become legal residents of places like Ohio, okay? So this story is about them negotiating and resisting a lot of the uh, ever-present racism and violence that is in places outside of the slave South, okay? And the challenges they endure, but also the kind of um, achievement and success that I think is a hallmark of their families um, in the 19th century. And then finally, I look to the British Empire, okay? It's a British world, folks, in the 19th century. And even though Jefferson in the 1780s said, the first thing that we need to do is get rid of jettison British power in order to be independent and equal, uh, his descendants knew better. They decided they could channel British power in flexible, op sometimes oppositional ways, either to um, violate state sovereignty and create a kind of unequal system, at the same time that they could use British power to uphold a nation's sovereignty or independence in the international system. So British power could be used in very different ways. And this is an innovation, I think, that emerges from the lives of these descendants. Okay, who exactly am I talking about? Some of you may be familiar with Annette Gordon-Reed's work, uh, path-breaking work about the Hemings family, but I think it's always useful to have a kind of genealogy at hand, okay? So I hope um, what you all see here in the middle, okay, is Thomas Jefferson flanked by two women. He fathered children with both of these women over the course of 40 years, not at the same time, right? Martha Wales Skelton was his white wife. He had children with her in the 1770s and 1780s. On the right is Sally Hemings, his property with whom he had children between the 1790s and 1810, okay? The kicker here is that these two women are half-sisters, okay? They have the same father, the slave trader, John Wales, okay? We don't have any illustrations or depictions, excuse me, of either woman, but uh, contemporary sources say that both were beautiful and that they did look alike, okay? So for this project, though, I'm mostly um, interested in the children of this daughter, Martha Jefferson Randolph. She had 12 kids, some of who have, I've already put up on the screen, and these children right here, okay? Because even though they seem to be of different generations, they're actually contemporaries on the Monticello mountaintop. They see each other grow up, okay? Um, so I'm interested in them because they are contemporaries. Okay, so let me start with this guy, 
This is Thomas Jefferson Randolph, Jefferson's namesake. His family members call him Jeff. He was born in 1792. Um, and at Jefferson's death, he's made executor of the estate. I'm sure many of you guys know that Jefferson died in debt. You may not know how in debt. Um, the grand total was something like $107,000, which is $3 million today. Okay? So he, Jeff Randolph, is unsure about what he's going to do because he inherits this debt. It's his job to satisfy all of the creditors okay, who are coming forward trying to recoup um, their losses. And he comes up with a variety of strategies to try to absolve those debts, uh, in part because he has to, but because he's all already worried about his position in society, the fact that he's been essentially taken down a peg because of this debt. Okay? It's important to point out the way that debt and dependence are connoted. Right? They mean essentially the same thing in this period. He's worried that his independent standing in Virginia elite society has been endangered, okay? And he's willing to do almost anything, folks, to climb his way out of that hole. So initially, he turns to Monticello, not to the house, not to the land, but to everything inside of it, to all the land, uh, livestock, excuse me, all of the agricultural machinery, and also to all of the people, okay? So one of the first things that he does uh, is put up for auction 130 people owned by his grandfather. Okay? Um, when appraisers come up to appraise the value of the estate, 90% um, of its worth is in these people. Okay? Um, and the sale, the auction that is, ensues, happens in this seemingly idyllic space the West Lawn becomes a slave market, okay, in 1827. And people like Peter Fawcett on the right and Anne Elizabeth Isaacs are among those forced to ascend the auction block and be divided from their families. However, I will say that both of their families did find freedom in Ohio, and it was through their perseverance that they bought each family member's freedom and eventually brought them to freedom um, across the Ohio River. Okay, well, I, so let me back up. After this sale, Jeff is able to generate about $30,000, okay? So you don't have to be a math genius to know that he still has at least $80,000 um, that he's gotta pay off. Enter strategy number two. And you wouldn't necessarily think this from looking at these books, but his big idea for generating money is to edit and publish a collection of Jefferson's writings. A friend, a political ally of Jeff Randolph says, dude, if you produce this, you could get up to $100,000. Jeff's like, what? Okay, I need to do this. So he secures a publisher, um, but guess what? It's a bust. Okay? He barely makes $1,000, right? So this was a ridiculous kind of scheme, but at the time, people thought that Jefferson had a reputation, a kind of popularity that would lead to this becoming a kind of bestseller. Okay. So it's not long before he has to turn his attention elsewhere to try to, again, um, pry himself out of debt. And the thing that he sets in his sights is the railroad. This is an image of the Virginia Central Railroad, uh, which started being built in the 1840s. Um, just um, so you guys can get your bearings, the Atlantic Ocean is here, the Appalachian River is, uh, mountains are here, excuse me. So initially this thing li links Richmond, right, the capital, with the tiny hamlet of Gordonsville. Okay? But the plan is to extend this railroad west to connect it with the Ohio River because this is industrialist dream to connect the Ohio to the Atlantic Ocean. Okay? And this is where this piece comes in. 
between Gordonsville and the Blue Ridge Mountains, right? Um, part of this, actually right here, traverses through Jeff Randolph's land. He owns a plantation called Edge Hill. It's about five miles from Monticello. He gets wind of this scheme and becomes an investor, okay? After that, he becomes a contractor. He's not just a contractor though. I mean, he's not doing any of the labor. Part of his contract is to use leased African Americans to build this track, okay? So what part of this story is, is really, or what this story is showing us is the extent to which huge infrastructure projects, canals, railroads, tunnels, uh, turnpikes are being created in Virginia and other places in the upper south that are giving rise to a new kind of slavery, industrial slavery, that no political economist predicted at this time. Okay, but this is what's happening. This is how the system is changing. And Jeff is in the middle of this. So when this sort of, um, the RFP is launched for this piece of the track, Jeff decides to throw his hat in the ring. Okay, he wants to, he decides he could um, find enough um, enslaved African Americans to do this whole track. Okay, and his proposed partner is the guy on the left. This is Richard Amahundro. Does Amahundro ring any bells? He is the brother of Silas Amahundro, the no notorious slave trader, slave dealer, based first in Alexandria and later in Richmond. Okay, so part of the reason Jeff um, partners with him is that he knows that Richard, through his brother, has access to an almost unlimited number of enslaved people, most of them um, auctioned off, but many of them simply hired out from places like Richmond to the railroads and other um, infrastructure projects. So Richard is a really important component of this story. Oops. Um, so what happens? Jeff doesn't get the contract for the whole track. He only gets a contract for part of it. But the value of that contract is $70,000, okay? Um, he saves a lot of money because um, by my research calculations, he's not hiring enslaved people from other people, he's using his own enslaved people. So enslaved men and boys are constructing about three miles of track between 1849 and 1852. And it's the proceeds from this contract that helped Jeff absolve these debts by the Civil War. Um, and they also help um, sort of restore his image, right, his status. He can once again hold his head high as this independent property holder and member of the Virginia elite. This is short-lived, however, because in 1861, he allies with the Confederacy decides to invest in Confederate war bonds and loses everything. He loses everything. So in fact, a formerly enslaved person, um, Isaac Granger, comes back, excuse me, it's Israel Gillette, comes back to visit Edge Hill, finds Jeff Randolph, could have slung in this chair on the portico, alone, destroyed, with no property, save a blind old mule. And I love that like, end to the story that it's, he's just alone, bankrupt with a mule. Okay, um, the other person that I wanna talk about um, is this man. This is an 1874 portrait by an obscure Scottish portraitist named Alexander Marquis, okay? He paints this in Madison, Wisconsin it immediately attracts a spate of criticism. People are like, that beard looks a little bit crooked. What's going on with that right arm? Why isn't it the same color as the left? Okay, so people are sort of really mean to Alexander Marquis about this painting, but I think that they miss the point because there is nothing wrong with this portrait 
according to the man who commissioned it. This man is John Wales Jefferson. He is a grandson of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. He looks like a white man. He is indeed African American. Okay? And this, I suggest in the book, is the culmination of his self-fashioning project as a white person. Okay? But to tell this story, we need to move back in time a little bit. John Wills Jefferson is the son of Eston Hemings, a son of who is himself a son of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. He and his brother Madison are freed according to the terms of Jefferson's will in 1826. They remain in Charlottesville for about a decade. Why do they do this? Because they live with their mother. Sally Hemings is never officially freed by the Jefferson Randolph family. And so they stay with her in a house that they purchase in Charlottesville. After she dies in 1835, though, they are basically hell-bent on getting out of the slave state of Virginia. And where do they go? They go to Ohio, as to many free African Americans from places like Virginia or Kentucky. And they land, essentially right here, just outside the town of Chillicothe. Okay. Um, I don't think we think enough about the boundary that these men crossed when they entered Ohio. Yes, they crossed the Ohio River, that sort of division line between slavery and freedom. But upon entering o Ohio, these men faced a spate of racially based restrictions. In order to become legal residents, they had to go to the courthouse, register, as well as find two white male guarantors who were willing to put up a $500 bond. Okay? That was all to become legal residents. If they did jump through that hoop, they still could not vote, serve on juries, have access to public resources, send their kids to public schools, um, bear arms, None of those rights are extended to free African American people in the quote unquote free state of Ohio. Okay? So the challenges that they faced were enormous, and yet they become prominent members of the growing African American community outside of Cincinnati and Chillicothe in the 1840s and 50s. However, um, there is a kind of sea change in this story in 1850. And I'm sure you all know the Fugitive Slave Act is passed. They have settled in a place that is 100 miles north of Kentucky. The Fugitive Slave Act just um, skyrockets the danger to the Hemings family members. Okay? Slave catchers are prowling this dividing line, and they could very easily be kidnapped and re-enslaved by slave dealers. Okay? So while Madison Hemings, the one brother, chooses to stay with his family, Eston Hemings makes the decision to leave. He and his wife and children move to Wisconsin, one of the only states that doesn't have these kinds of restrictions on migration um, and legal um, residency that places like Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois have at this time. Okay? So once they get to Madison, Wisconsin, though, they change their name. They drop the Hemings surname and replace it with Jefferson. And they also decide to live as white people. Okay? So they sever all connections with their African-American family in the decision to live um, as a white family. John Wales Jefferson as he is now called, is 17 years old when this happens. Okay? Um, his father is a cabinet maker, Eston works as a cabinet maker until he dies. But it's clear that John Wells Jefferson is an entrepreneur, okay? and that he's quite keen to style himself in a way that he feels he couldn't as an African American man um, acting within the bounds of white supremacy in Ohio. Okay. So by 1860, he's become not just a property holder, 
but the owner of a hotel. He owns something called the American Hotel in Madison, Wisconsin. As you can see at the top here, he has, he has become this independent land holding man, property holding um, person who is equal to other white men. He has substantial real estate, right? His personal estate is valued at $14,500. It's an enormous sum. And these are his dependents, okay? Some of his family members, but look, these are all hotel employees. Most of them European immigrants. You can see they're from Norway, Germany, Ireland, Prussia, okay? These are the dependents um, in who, with whom he's in charge. And if you wanna sort of compare that to Madison Hemings, his uncle, at the same time in 1860, Right? Madison Hemings is still living as an African-American man in Southern Ohio. Um, his personal real estate, personal estate is worth $300, okay? Um, he has recently purchased a farm that's worth $1,500, but he is a farmer, okay? He is not a large property holder. So I think very clearly you can see the inequity that is growing out of this family based on their racial identity. Um, and here at the side, this is one of the first times that uh, Madison Hemings declares his familial connection with Jefferson. He tells the census taker, I am the son of Thomas Jefferson, okay? Okay, but I wanna emphasize that John Wales Jefferson's white identity is precarious, and he knows it to be so, in part because he has an encounter before the Civil War erupts with an acquaintance, an old acquaintance from Chillicothe. The man recognizes him. The man recognizes him as an African-American man and threatens to tell, any, excuse me, to tell everyone that he's seen him in Wisconsin and to sort of broadcast this news in Ohio. And I think John Wales Jefferson gets really afraid and he knows that he has to do even more work to cement his whiteness, his status as this person in Madison, Wisconsin. So what does he do? He joins uh, the Union Army in the Civil War, okay? He becomes, he enters the war as a major and fights in the Western theater. Um, he actually goes first, where is it? He goes first to Southeastern Missouri. He crisscrosses the Southeast, um, really in 1862-63. He fights at Vicksburg. He fights in the ill-fated um, Red River campaign. He is everywhere, okay? But he's also a highly visible Union officer, okay? He ensures that. How does he do that? He writes letters. He writes letters to his brother. He writes letters to newspaper editors. Every single one of them is published. What is every single one of these letters underscore? That he is a gallant, manly white officer, okay? He is very self-consciously creating this white persona that no one will be able to refute at the end of the war, okay? Oop, we go back here for a second. So part of what John Wales Jefferson sees uh, in the Western theater is around here. Well, really from Memphis to um, New Orleans, okay? He sees the Cotton Empire. Uh, some of it being devastated by the war, but he is absolutely um, entranced by the wealth created by these cotton plantations. So what does he do after he musters out in 1864, after the war's end? Um, he returns south to Memphis, his white identity more assured. He buys up cotton plantations on the Arkansas side, so this is the Arkansas side, that's the city of Memphis. He's one of the co-founders of the Memphis Cotton Exchange and becomes one of the wealthiest people in Memphis, OK? 
Okay? He's a cotton factor, a plantation owner, um, a union officer who actually corresponds with presidents. Okay? And of all of these family members, he is by far the wealthiest. I'd like to end with this man. This is a great grandson of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. His name is Frederick Madison Roberts. He is the first African American state legislator in California. He's also a member of the NAACP. He is the first person in my research who actively, explicitly engages with the Declaration. Nobody else does. Okay. Um, and he, along with so many black activists of this era, redefines what the Declaration means to us today. Okay. He, in his work in California, transforms it from being this historical, exclusionary um, document rooted in 1776 to a document that's universal, that's timeless, and that is inclusive of all people, including people of color, okay? Jefferson's declaration is not Frederick Madison Roberts's declaration. His declaration is the one that most closely mirrors our own. Thank you. a very general question. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this making of race in the Middle West where all these things are sure. sort of colliding in yep. Ohio, Illinois, Indiana especially because, I mean, bringing up the, the, the slave sales south is, is one version of westward expansion and then the expansion uh, up with, with butternuts and then again with these black families into the Middle West region which shapes the racial policies there. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit because I think this is such an interesting snapshot of all of that. Yeah, I think um, traditionally, and especially at, at Monticello, you know, the story was it sort of sort of ended with freedom. Like um, these people were able to finally find freedom after enduring the horror of slavery. But there, the story ended. And I was really curious about um, what really happened in Ohio and Wisconsin after Jefferson died, um, and the kind of challenges that they were faced with. And I think um, my research questions kind of dovetailed with emerging or important scholarship right now about immigration, about race, and about citizenship that is really honing on on states, right? Because I said earlier, until 1868, until the 14th Amendment, the federal government neither guarantees nor oversees national citizenship. Citizenship is done by states. Um, and the kind of different strategies that these states took, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, um, most prominently to restrict the immigration of African Americans or to prohibit it completely, which is what Indiana actually does, I think is a really important piece of this story and just underscores the kind of hardship and challenge that these free African Americans faced in trying to become equal and independent members of this society, right? Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Oops. I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit about the um, falling into obscurity of Jefferson and the, the rediscovery of Jefferson oh. in the first third of the, the 20th century. Uh, what, what, what were the catalysts behind that? Where, where did Jefferson come back and, and why? Right, yeah, so he, he actually, what part of the reason that he sinks into obscurity is because, well, for African Americans, right, he's uh, written these, this document, the Declaration, that is never fulfilled, right? He's, he's hypocritical, um, and so he's sort of quite easily marginalized. Um, but for white Southerners in particular, the second paragraph is hugely problematic because he seems to be guaranteeing rights to people that they don't want to guarantee rights to. 
Um, so he becomes a kind of bete noir for pro-slavery Southerners um, before the Civil War, and then nobody really talks about him. Between the Civil War and World War II, it's really FDR um, faced with the forces of Nazism and fascism, who sort of plucks him from obscurity and says, this guy, this is our apostle of democracy, people. Um, he actually did during the campaign, the 32 campaign. Okay. The 32 campaign was way before the, the Nazis. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, he, Jeff has spoken, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in any event, it really coincides with um, with well, World War the rise of World War II. Um, so even though we think that Jefferson has been this venerated um, person for centuries, it's really been just a couple of decades, um, you know, that he enjoyed this huge popularity and this kind of um, lion uh, lionization. So um, you know, it was 18, uh, sort of 1932 to say the 1990s when his stock began to tank. Right? It was only sort of 50 years of fame. <laughs> but that was the reason. Yeah, he just wasn't, compared to Lincoln, compared to Washington, the guy was just, and that's one reason that Monticello fell into disrepair. Just nobody cared. Yeah, I mean, when, when um, Jeff Randall finally sold Monticello in 1831, again, to try to stem the bleeding of this debt, um, he's, he thinks he's gonna get $40,000. He gets $7,500 from a local druggist who's gonna turn Monticello into silkworm farm. So. Okay, Matt's got a question back oh, sorry. there. We're gonna to have to do teamwork to pass this microphone. Here we go. Brilliant. Um, uh, so yeah, I just wanted to ask a little bit about like the role of religion. And um, yeah. it's a little bit too far one well. uh, Firstly, like when they're making these claims, Jefferson and his descendants making a claim to the Um, so his, his actually his white grandchildren become sort of evangelicals, which is quite interesting. It's beyond the scope of, of my project. What I will say about um, spirituality for the African American descendants, I mean, part of what I didn't sort of get, get to talk about today was Madison Hemings, who's the only one of the uh, children of Jefferson and Sally Hemings who retains his African American identity. Um, and I think um, in Ohio, rather than aspiring to be a white citizen, or excuse me, a citizen, which is, you know, connoted with whiteness, I really think that he undertakes this project of citizenship that is outside of the scope of the state. You might know about the recent historiography on homemade citizenship, um, which really underscores this black achievement and success outside of these more le uh, sort of legal categories of citizenship. And I think spirituality and religion were part and parcel, really important parts of that um, kind of vernacular citizenship that he's embracing really between the 1830s um, and the Civil War. Um, I think uh, religion is part of what defines their community. Um, and you can see it, I think, really clearly in the number of non-Hemmings descendants actually settle in Southern Ohio, formerly enslaved at Monticello, um, most of them become heads of churches, okay? And at the same time, they become um, operators on the Underground Railroad. So religion and activism, I think, very much intersect for these African Americans in Ohio especially. Does Jefferson's grandson, who dies with the mule, uh, uh, <laughs> that one, uh, who's selling his works, think about going to Congress to sell them? Because Madison, in order to take care of Dolly, right. approaches Congress, and Madison thinks his papers are worth, get this, $100,000, uh, and they're not worth anything on the open market either. Right. Um, why don't they try to tap into that? And uh, if memory serves me right, something Washington has written has also been bought by Congress already 
and published, and it's been given a great deal of money. Do they do anything like that? I don't, you know, I don't know. I haven't seen any evidence that they go directly to Congress. But what Jeff Randolph is is doing is is um, after Jefferson's death, he's going up and hanging out in parties and drawing rooms of all the members of Congress, and sort of saying, "Would you like to buy this bust for five grand? Or could your state possibly like?" Uh, bankroll my family, which is actually what Louisiana, for example, does. They give them bank shares that they sort of take a draw, an annual draw on to help, help them sort of stay afloat. So he's not going to Congress explicitly, but he certainly is going to individuals and trying to curry favor with them in order to convince them to either um, buy stuff or persuade their constituents back home that they should help support this family. Uh, hello. Hi. Um, so I'd just like to ask if the Jefferson family somewhat um, fell out of notoriety going into Reconstruction post-Civil War, um, but they were also wealthy members of societies like in Memphis or in Ohio, how, what did they do during Reconstruction and how did they remain somewhat anonymous and out of the public eye if they were wealthy and functioning in these societies? Sorry, are you talking about the African-American family members? Yes, like the general in Memphis. Um, so John Wales Jefferson um, did not broadcast that he was a descendant of Thomas Jefferson. He never, he never um, uh, revealed that to the public. So um, even though he has this sort of surname, he adopts, he and his, that his part of the family adopt the surname of Jefferson, he never says, I'm the son of Thomas Jefferson the way, for example, Madison Hemings does. Um, so he has this fantastical wealth, and he, he does, you know, he does stuff like he breeds racehorses, just like Jefferson does, um, but he makes no explicit connection. Um, however, Madison Hemings, who does make a few explicit connections before 1870, um, uh, is, doesn't have a fraction of this wealth, right? He's a farmer, he's a carpenter, um, if you read his probate, right, it's really just, it's sort of like a bed, a black mare, and a list of tools with which he plies his trade. Um, and his real estate is, is just really about, you know, it's a few thousand dollars. So the disparity is really incredible. Um, but not all of these um, families are really making that connection explicit. Um, and especially for Madison Hemings and his descendants, sort of after Reconstruction, Jefferson fades out completely. They don't care about him. Um, they're, they want to be tied to Sally Hemings. She's much more important to their identity and their sort of familial history. Um, I'm curious to what degree did Thomas Jefferson sort of teach his descendants about, um, you know, the role he had played in the American Revolution. You know, I'm, I've studied John Quincy Adams quite a bit, and I know how intense John Adams was with educating him about all of that. Did Thomas Jefferson do something similar, um, or, you know, or not? Yes. Um, well, not in sort of the revolution, but mm -hmm. he did become a kind of educator of the rising generation mm -hmm. of white men, mm -hmm. um, in part because he was so worried that they were going to fail. Um, so he tutored his um, grandchildren, uh, like Francis Epps. Let me just get back so, uh, to the sort of tree so I can. So um, the children of, of Mariah Epps here, the, the one surviving child, Francis Epps is tutored by him at Monticello. Um, one of Martha Jefferson Randolph's um, daughters marries a guy called Nicholas Trist, who reads law with Jefferson at Monticello. Other grandchildren attend UVA uh, at Jefferson's request. Um, so even if he's not sort of saying, I am the revolution or I am the nation, he's taking great care to ensure that they um, receive an education either by him or at UVA. Okay? And again, this is to prepare them to be these sort of citizen leaders um, uh, of the next generation. Hi, thank you so much. Um, 
My question is, is that I understand relative to Ohio that Wisconsin was a much less formidable place for Essen Hemmings to migrate his family. But I'm curious is, did you learn anything about the challenges they faced building that hotel empire in Madison, Wisconsin? And could you just talk a little bit about the environment there for free black Americans? Oh yeah, so let me go back. Right, so Wisconsin is, as I, I sort of intimated, distinct in that it doesn't have the kind of migration prohibition or surveillance that these three states have. Sorry, I'll use this. These three states have. Um, however, slavery existed in Wisconsin well into the 19th century. There are lead mines um, that were discovered in the late 18th century, which attracted slaveholders from places like you betcha, Missouri, um, and they brought their enslaved people up to Wisconsin. So this is a, um, a society that has a strong connection to slavery. The state constitution that's um, passed in 1846 explicitly excludes African Americans. It includes white um, uh, uh, in order to define citizenship. Um, however, it is the only state in the Union to nullify the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, so there are some exceptional things about Wisconsin, but um, you should by no means think that it um, did not sort of um, embrace or continue a lot of these sort of deep-seated racism that these other Midwestern states um, really put forward. Thank you. Is that, yeah. That was Oh, but in terms of the Madison Hotel, so he didn't actually, he, he didn't build the hotel, he just bought it. Oh. Um, but I think being a hotel keeper allowed him to begin this sort of very public self-fashioning project in which he's claiming whiteness really in the, in the public square, but he's using journalists and newspapers in order to cement and sort of reify that identity beginning with the hotel, but also well into the Civil War. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hi, so um, when I saw the title, mm -hmm. and it was about, thank you, Sally Hemings, I thought it would be more focused on the sexual violence among black women. Do you talk uh -huh. about that at all in your book and Sally Hemings herself? So Sally Hemings is not the kind of focus of this book in, in part because um, that's something that Annette Gordon-Reed really writes about and is gonna be writing about in a, in a forthcoming book. But I absolutely acknowledge that, you know, that the existence of that, you know, and I think it's a, it's a really important part of the story. Um, at the same time, I want to celebrate the integrity of these individuals and of their families. Um, it's a story that we don't often see told. As I said earlier, the story usually ends with freedom and we don't think about the challenges and the impediments that they overcame to claim citizenship in the Reconstruction era. And to me, that story of achievement is really important. Um, in a family that has been unacknowledged and thrust into the shadows for so long. So that's an important piece of, of the story, but I don't, I also want to celebrate these families and actually put them on the same sort of level playing field as, as the other members of this family, which they've never gotten in a book before. I think we have time for couple more questions, but I'm just going to ask one while oh. people are thinking. Um, uh, for a comment first, <clears throat> I love that Jefferson leaves all the, I don't love that he leaves the debts, but what a wonderful American story to leave one's debts to one's successors. Um, yep. My question is about family. What is, you know, what does this story suggest about 19th century family, how mm -hmm. it might change over time? I mean, the classic narrative, isn't it, of family and, and gender roles in particular, but the, f the small family becoming kind of codified as the 19th century progresses. But you're showing us a much larger view of family and mm -hmm. that the, the family members have that or their 
testing new ideas about it that are entwined with race. And then in some ways, people that aren't actually part of Jefferson's bloodlines also might conceive of themselves as part of the family. You think about all the young men that he kind of tutored at Monticello, which would no doubt would go on their lives thinking that they were part of the Jefferson family, as it were. So what does your book tell us about family in the 19th century and how it changes? Yeah, I think um, sort of as you suggest, you know, the, the book is kind of um, looks at family through a sort of very diasporic lens, right? It's really about people who were born at or who grew up at Monticello proper and left and sort of made their way in the wider world, going to places like what is now the Midwest, but also going to Britain, to China, to Mexico, and to Cuba. And I think um, what they carried with them, though, wasn't so much was, yes, familial connection, um, but was a commitment to these principles, but also an understanding that these principles hadn't yet been realized at the close of the American Revolution, and that the kind of crises or challenges that they found themselves embroiled in in places like Ohio or Havana or Canton in China um, necessitated that they develop different strategies and ideas about how to implement um, these principles um, far removed from Monticello. Um, but I'm trying to, I think, in terms of how I'm looking at family, I think it goes along with, with my previous response, which is it's very important to me that people see Jefferson's family in this capacious, multiracial way, um, and that we stop thinking of them um, as a white family and as a very nuclear family, um, because they themselves thought of it in a much more capacious, complicated, and very troubling way that I think we, um, to this point, have thought of them. Great. Any last questions? Hi there. I just wanted to hear if you had any uh, reflections on where the phenomenon of passing uh, mm -hmm. is in this story. I mean, obviously, a lot of the people you're describing are choosing to mm -hmm. shift their racial identity based on circumstances. Um, but sort of by focusing on the Jefferson Hemings family, I, I sort of got the sense that maybe the, the looming shadow of this aristocratic or elite or famous family is also in some way uh, shaping their self-identification, whether positive or negative, or wanting to embrace it, wanting to reject it, wanting to hide it, wanting to expose it. So just anything on the sort of nexus of celebrity and passing? Sure, yeah, I mean, and I think as you sort of hint, it really varies very high, uh, very uh, according to the individual. Um, so two of Jefferson's children with Sally Hemings, Beverly and Harriet Hemings, leave the Monticello plantation without pursuit in 1822. They just leave, no one follows them, and they um, eventually go to Washington, D.C. and live as white people. And um, even though Catherine Carrison has written a book that includes or sort of highlights Harriet Hemings, we really know almost nothing about these two people other than what Madison Hemings tells us about his siblings um, and that he himself has essentially lost contact with them because they have passed into the white world. So we don't really know, and we haven't located any of their descendants either to sort of say whether they had this connection or publicized it or whatever. Um, we know much more about Madison and Eston Hemings. Um, Madison Hemings, I think, um, publicizes his connection to Jefferson um, really between the Civil War and uh, sort of the mid-1870s. Um, and I think that um, runs parallel, or he does that um, after the Emancipation Proclamation, after the 14th and 15th Amendment, in which he is now, has now become a white citizen of the United States. And I think um, claiming Jefferson's parentage helps prove Jefferson's parentage, so his blood, um, and, and as well as the fact that he was born in the United States, right? He's checking all the two boxes 
um, that qualify him for citizenship in the United States under the aegis of the 14th Amendment. So I think parentage, uh, white parentage as a claim for citizenship is very, very important for Madison Hemings. For Eston Hemings, I think the strongest um, connection is really in the fact that they claim the surname Jefferson. Um, there is evidence that they told people in Madison, Wisconsin that they were connected to Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson. But I don't think, uh, this was much later, sort of after the Civil War, not before, especially when somebody like John Wills Hemings' racial identity was so precarious. So this was, that was really sort of a post-war phenomenon. But this is, I think this just underscores how differently um, the connection was publicized and, and sort of understood by different members of this family. Okay, well let's give our hand, put our hands together to thank Krista. It's such a, a wonderful story that ranges across a time, but obviously also across space and says so much about Jefferson, but also the, the world that he helped to create and, is, and that those related to him created. Uh, we look forward to buying it in 2024. We hope it's still a 2024 book. If it not, is. we can wait till 2025. Uh, we'll no, it wait. is emphatically a 2024 book. It's emphatically book. a 2024. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, we're wrapping up a little early today. The uh, staff here has another, we have another event later this evening. Uh, we do have a few minutes, so you're welcome to pick up some of the last food and, and drink on the way out. We do need to ask for everyone to clear out in the next 10 or so minutes today. Um, but don't worry, we will have a full program next semester with long, with long celebrations after. Thanks again to Krista for a wonderful paper.